thing that when the Zeppelin guys get together, there is this black cloud, you know, the whole atmosphere changed, darkness. And I remember arriving and going into the trailer and saying, hi guys, okay. So, and Jimmy Page said, so how does it go? Stay with heaven, huh? How does it go? So I said, well, you know, I know where, this is where I come in and I go, da 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 He said, no, no. And I thought, okay. <laughs> it was like I was being torn up, taken apart. Very, in a very weird way. Led Zeppelin said their own performance was substandard. And since then, they've blocked all attempts to broadcast it. And they were in a funny mood during it. I and mean, Jimmy was dribbling everywhere. I mean, Robert, Robert's voice wasn't sung in. I actually, there's quite a lot of me when I kind of, my hands go up in the air not playing. You know, I'm playing and then there's a fill coming and I sort of just play the air for a bit and then come back in. I could, I did toy with the idea momentarily at that point of walking off, but I couldn't walk off because we'd all be sitting here talking about that now. Led Zeppelin later blamed Phil Collins for their disappointing performance. He said, well, you know, what can you expect? We had one drummer that was halfway across the Atlantic. And we said, well, they don't fucking have a go at me. You guys were off, man. I was, I was together. I knew my stuff. Back at Wembley, another rock and roll giant was about to fall victim, this time to the BBC's technical gremlins. Why don't you all... Worse was to come. After weeks of schmoozing and ego massaging, pop legend Paul McCartney had finally agreed to take part. He hadn't performed live for six years. I was so unrehearsed, Bob just sort of said, oh, the piano's just round that curtain there, it's just, it's the white one. I went, ah! I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't hear myself or anything, and the crowd was sort of going wild. I couldn't hear anything. And normally you've got a little bit of a monitor or something and you can sort of hit ding, ding, ding. OK, that's my piano. You know, when I've heard, that's my voice, here we go. There's nothing. some sound, but in the stadium, they could hear nothing. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm the guy that told him, you know, about nuts and bolts and tickety-boo. <laughs> I can't hear him. <laughs> I showed him a picture of the sound system, <laughs> and he can't hear it. I wanted to sink into a hole when it all went wrong. He was probably the most important artist for us on the show to give it credibility. And um, I've always bit sad about that. In fact, never worked for Paul McCartney since. Paul McCartney was singing to himself for nearly two minutes before the sound engineers finally switched on his mic. <laughs> The great thing was the audience joined in. God bless the audience. They joined in and saved the day, you know, and I said, it was all like, OK. OK, now you. I 
remember having to share, oh, to my eternal shame, having to share a microphone with David Bowie and then seeing later that I'd hogged it. Oh my God, the humiliation. I, I don't believe I've done that. David Bowie. David Bowie. <laughs> David Bowie, the microphone with me. <laughs> The stars trooped on stage for the sing-along that everybody had been waiting for. have been so fantastic. I wish I'd been there. Yeah, me no. Because <laughs> I've seen the footage back. <laughs> I'm swaying away at the back there, lovely. Singing away like a pub singer, pint in one hand, lovely. <laughs> and I knew. <laughs> what <should> we... uh... <laughs> I was kind of walking backwards into the crowd to, to sink into the, you know, I wasn't going to get up there and start fighting for mics. And Bob grabbed me by the arm and pulled me forward and stuck a mic in my face. So I finally, I did it eventually sing a line on the song. <laughs> George Michael grabbed a mic and said, sing. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and if my ego's a bit bruised later, um, it soon died away. It wasn't a problem, you know, it didn't matter. It wasn't about that at all. It was about pulling it off. And we pulled it off. We're back to Philadelphia now. Thank you very much for coming. Please leave the stadium slowly and quietly. It's been the most fantastic day. Thank you. Drink sangria in the park 
And then later, when it gets dark, we go home. In 12 frenzied weeks, and against all the odds, Bob Geldof had pulled off the impossible. Donations and tributes to the concerts that captured the conscience of the world have gone on pouring in today. the young people of Britain and America, moved by the plight of thousands of others, thousands of miles. But they're now talking about an estimated total of 40 million pounds. Oh, it's such a perfect day. The donations were far bigger than anyone could have hoped. More than 50 million pounds for the starving of Africa. And it was a day that no one who lived through it would ever forget. It was one of those moments, and there aren't many of those in life, that everyone has got a common experience of it. Everyone remembers where they were. Everyone remembers what they felt about it. It, it was one of those, one of those little pegs you hang all your other memories on. You're going to read just what you saw. Live Aid changed forever. The attitude of people who thought nothing could be done about something enormous. Bullying. Cantankerous. He's a cunt. Count, count, and count. Difficult. A fucking lunatic. Fucking great. Gift of gab. <laughs> He's a good man. He's irascible. Indignant. Intimidating. He's outrageous. Irish scruffy wanker. Passionate. Pain in arse. Super human being. Stubborn. And rude. combination of him being a horrible stroppy bastard, being incredibly aggressive and forceful, um, having an enormous initiative and drive actually were the things that made this happen. Because if you'd been rather nice and quiet and, you know, self-effacing and self-deprecating, you couldn't possibly have put such an enormous project together. Bob likes his position of power and he uses it pretty well but he can bully at the same time. He can be dominant, uh, ignore all the advice around him when he feels like it. But on the other hand, he can be kind and caring, and he'll listen. What Bob did is he actually went for it and he did it. And, uh, you know, who can say that? Anyone that can criticize him, or anyone that can say, yes, but, you know, it's like, fuck off, you wanker. Because, you know, he actually went out and did it. And he did something that, frankly, I don't know anyone else that could do it. He actually proved that rock and roll can make a difference and musicians can make a difference. And they did and continue to make a difference today. That is democracy. And long live Bob Geldof. <laughs> Back even further in time here on BBC4 on Friday at 8 with the birth of British music. And next tonight we're heading to the States and America's Dirty South with Rich Hall.